thank you all so much uh, for being here this morning. <clears throat> I would like to thank uh, at the very beginning to uh, Dr. Suhen Dota for inviting me and for your kind introduction. I would also like to thank the director of ICR SIBA for being here <clears throat> and for, your, for inviting me as well. <clears throat> I'm visiting now India. So <clears throat> what I thought when Dr. <clears throat> Ota con contacted me <clears throat> to give a talk a few days ago, I was just thinking that what would be the topic of my presentation? And because all of you are very much aware of this field, <clears throat> and many of you know more than I do, and I don't hesitate to admit it. With that being said, I thought, okay, why don't I touch one important disease? which is EHP and white feces disease. And then I will discuss something entirely different and unrelated to EHP, but I think very, very relevant in today's world. As most of us are focused on pathogen discovery, developing diagnostic tools, I believe the next decade we'll see quite a bit of work on developing therapeutics. Because unless we develop therapeutics, prevention will help us to grow shrimp aquaculture only to, to certain extent. Beyond that, we really need to think about developing therapeutics. And towards that end, I'm going to share with you some reverse genetics approach that we have taken in developing antiviral therapies. So basically, there are the two <clears throat> independent areas that I'll be touching and some concluding remarks. Um, let me check one thing here. Give me a second. I don't make sure. Okay. <clears throat> As I was preparing this talk, <clears throat> I thought that there is no need for me to highlight the importance of shrimp aquaculture in India and in Asia. All of you know uh, the, the importance and the extent of losses caused by number of diseases in shrimp. But I will highlight some key points and what are the real challenges in studying these diseases. This paper <clears throat> that came out I think at the end of last year, caught my attention. And I, I'm, I'm pretty sure many of you are here in the audience, probably. Economic loss due to diseases in Indian shrimp farming with a special reference to EHP. What caught my attention was this statement that I copied and highlighted, copied from the abstract and highlighted here. EHP with a 17% probability of occurrence accounts for a production loss of almost a million tons and a commercial value of almost 570 million US dollars. And one other thing in that abstract that caught my attention is national loss of revenue due to EHP was higher, primarily because in Andhra Pradesh, which is a primary shrimp producing state, had a prevalence of disease, the EHP prevalence of 22% against 8%. The bottom line is, as EHP spreads, and uh, <clears throat> it does cause a chronic disease more than an acute disease, um, the extent of losses are becoming instrumental. So with that being said, just a few um, important points with respect to EHP and the disease it causes, which is called hepatopancreatic microsporidiosis or HPM. Interestingly, the disease was discovered or described in Monodon from Thailand in <clears throat> early 2000. And just like any other disease that does not cause significant mortality, we really don't pay as much attention. And it's a, you know, 
common human behavior when there's a disease that causes large scale mortality. Obviously, everyone pays attention. But what happens when a disease doesn't cause losses? Instead, it causes um, retarded growth and size variability. So really, until the manifestation uh, comes to our attention, we really tend to pay less attention. And H EHP HPM is, is such an example. One of the thing I would like to highlight that the fact that it the, the pathogen infects or the tissues that it target, uh, targets is the um, hepatopancreas, which is a critical organ for absorption of nutrient, production of antimicrobial compounds. So it's like, you know, hepatopancreas is analogous to livers of um, higher vertebrates. So if our liver is damaged, obviously the growth will be compromised and, and immunity as well. And <clears throat> coupled with the fact that it does not kill, instead causes chronic mortality. That is where I think is the most important challenge with respect to managing EHP. <clears throat> and the fact that it infects such an important organ, it leads to increased susceptibility to number of diseases, including the ones that like APIN or EMX, which infects um, hepatopancreas. If you ask me to make a prediction, I would say that unless we manage EHP, you will see more and more diseases that will impact hepatopancreas. And probably you will end up finding or discovering new disease or viral, new viruses and so forth. I will not be surprised. Let me make a prediction. And we did a study in India, uh, just some survey with respect to EHP prevalence. What caught my attention again, that we could detect the pathogen in shrimp collected from farms that have wide range of salinity, all the way from almost fresh water to as high as 30 and above. So that also poses some challenge. These points I'm highlighting because you can see from evolutionary perspective, how potent and how competent this pathogen is in surviving in wide range of environment, infecting a very critical organ. Here are some uh, slides that I want to share. When we sample shrimp from ponds that have been affected by EHP and we sample it and put it on a, on a bucket and you will see the animals are lying on the side and they're not moving as much, they're just weak. And in some cases, we end up seeing the white gut. If we do um, weight mount, we may end up seeing some melanization and constriction of the hepatopancreatic tubule. Now, I, I need to mention this thing, that EHP is a very unique pathogen that has evolved to avoid host response, immune response of host. Either it suppresses or it avoids. We do not know what exactly, what molecular mechanism it uses. But the, the outcome is that it, the host does not respond. However, this EHP infection makes the animal weak and they are susceptible to uh, vibrios. And it is the bacterial infection really that leads to this sort of melanization. Histology and other molecular tools are well established. This is just to give a quick overview. You can see in HNE histology, you can see plasmodium. You can see EHP spores as well as some cells into you know, sometimes, sometimes you will see, you will see doing dialysis, those who have kidney stones. Okay, may I, may I ask Dr. Rota to, to switch off the microphone of the audience? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. And you will see occasionally that uh, upon infection, these epithelial cells are just about to slough off. And then in later stage, you will see this kind of sloughed up cell containing uh, plasmodium with a GIMSA stain that targets that you can use for fungal staining. You can see the spores. 
So with that being said, if you look in a very objective manner, what, what are the challenges regarding PHP? And one of the challenges that we faced in our lab uh, soon after I joined was the lack of a rapid amplification method. There was no way to amplify EHP um, relatively quickly and um, generate large quantity of inoculum. What we did, we, we did a series of studies to see what could be the quick, fastest way of generating large quantity of EHP. And we found that if we inject inoculum, inoculum directly into the of a healthy animal, we'll be able to reproduce the disease very quickly within less than two weeks, actually. Why this is important, you will see in a moment. When we are asked in our lab by many um, you know, shrimp uh, hatcheries and, and, and breeding companies to produce or to screen large number of animals for EHP resistance, we really faced a serious challenge because we don't have enough inoculum. The, one of the easiest and robust method of uh, challenging animals is to take a healthy animal and, and feed it EHP infected hepatopancreas. But then that hepatopancreas has to come from an EHP infected uh, animal. So what we did here is we injected, let me turn off this thing. Uh, we injected uh, we injected a whole bunch of animals and, and and this is the injection of inoculum directly into the hepatopancreas and then we sacrifice these animals at 15 30 and 45 days post injection and then we analyzed by pcr and histopathology and then so this is what we found we found that upon injection of the inoculum directly into the hepatopancreas within 15 days, you can see the pathogen load. Um, it's less than 20, it's pretty high. And then as time passes, there is a trend, the note, you have a 19 CT and now the cycle threshold value has a reverse relation, lower the number, higher the pathogen load. So what you see as time progresses, you see, and a very high load of pathogen, then it decreases and then it increases. Just keep that in mind and I'll show you some very interesting data to highlight how the life cycle of EHP with respect to pathogenesis is happening. It's pretty interesting. Bottom line, what we found that if we inject animals directly into hepatopancreas, within 15 days, we can generate large amount of animals. Because remember, you can take one EHP infected animal, dissect the hepatopancreas, and you can produce enough inoculum to inject 50 animals, 40, 50 animals. So you can have really large amount of infected animals and, and HP within 15 days. Then what we did, we sacrificed those animals at 15 days, 30 days, or 45 days and then dissected the HP and fed it to healthy animals. And each group again, we sacrificed at 15, 30 and 45 days. Basically what you wanted to generate large quantity of inoculum very quickly, and then see how good that inoculum is in terms of using it for screening um, healthy animals. And uh, what we found, that when injected the inoculum into HP and sacrificed the animal at 15 days post injection, and then sacrificed those injected animals, dissected the HP and fed, you can get very high EH protection. Bottom line, within 50, 30 days from the time you start injecting, and then in 15 days time, you generate a large amount of inoculum, that you can dissect and feed it to as many animals as you need. So basically within 30 to 40 days, we can screen large number of animals for EHP resistance. The, part, the reason for me to show you this is there is a need 
to develop EHP resistant line. And I think this simple but use, useful method would enable us to screen large number of animals relatively quickly, which we could not do until very recently. With that being said, one other thing I want to show you. So, you know, there are a lot of papers and we showing that, okay, EHP causes growth retardation, but to my knowledge, there is not very many or if at all, none to show that and, and determine how many days upon feeding HP infected animals, you need to raise them in order to see um, deep impact on growth in the laboratory. Bear in mind when different companies send genetic lines to us to screen, we need to have a very robust and simple method. We cannot have really a very you know, uh, complicated or elaborate method. It's not just going to be feasible for us to follow. So our goal is always to develop a very simple model so here is a model, and I showed you that we can generate large number of inoculum relatively quickly and then take that inoculum and feed it to, this is a Vanami um, <coughs> larvae, uh, juvenile, I should say. And you can see the blue box indicates uh, healthy animals and, and the orange box is the infected animal. Again, bottom line, you can see that within 30 days, there's a trend on, on re uh, reduction in growth. So today, I think it is safe to say for me that we have <clears throat> methods available we could use to screen large number of animals relatively quickly. One other thing <clears throat> we have been doing is we're trying to understand how EHP causes growth retardation. What is the mechanism? Towards that end, we thought, can we really look into the microbiome <clears throat> of EHP infected animals over time from the time an animal gets infected? So this work was done by my postdoc, Dr. Roberto Cruz, who is now a scientist in, in one of the leading marine biology institute in Mexico called CCC. And uh, Roberto and his postdoc, Antonio, did much of the analysis. So let me share with you some interesting things that um, we did. Basically what we did is we did a cohabitation challenge model. So we had a tank of shrimp infected with EHP. We put some healthy animals, okay? And then we sampled every three days for all the way to 30 days. And every time two to three infected animals we will, will sample and then we'll do microbiome analysis of the hepatopancreas in those animals. That would give us a change in microbiome dynamics over time and space. We also did inside to um, H &E histology and inside to hybridization to develop a quantitative histology so that we can screen a large number of animals relatively quickly. And then, <clears throat> This microbiome data we analyze to see what is the relative abundance of different types of microbiome over time and space. Here's a summary of the data. The manuscript is being submitted and uh, hopefully will be accepted very soon. But what we did is we collected again samples and over time, every two to three days, did HE and ISH. And we graded them at infection grade sub zero when there's no infection all the way to grade four. And, and we, what we found that as time passes, you can pay attention to this last um, panel on the bottom right panel. Basically, as time passes, soon after infection, you see an increase in the EHP load. And as time passes, it kept on increasing and then it decreases. And then if you continue, it will come back to repeat this cycle. Basically, we could divide the life cycle of EHP into early, developmental, and late stages. So there are three stages. So what's the importance of it? 
when I presented this data recently in a conference, um, there was a scientist from another country as somewhere in Asia, and he made a very interesting comment that caught my attention. And he said, you know, Dr. Dar, we collect, we got some, we had some pond that had EHP outbreak. And we found that there are a bunch of animals, most of them had reduced growth, but there are some of them, they were pretty big size. So we thought that, okay, we can bring those into their breeding facility and maintain them and probably they're resistant, right? Guess what happened? As they kept them at the beginning, and they were doing some fecal screening from uh, collect the feces and then screen EHP. So at the beginning, they found that there was nothing there. So they thought those animals are probably resistant, but as they maintained them, they suddenly see that those animals are showing a pretty high level of EHP. And that can be explained by the observations that we made. Basically, again, there is a cyclic pattern of EHP infection. You have an early developmental late stage, it goes down and then it again comes back. So we looked at the microbiome and what we found that there's a transition from a healthy hepatopancreatic microbiome flora that, so at the early stage when the infection happens, you will find which we mark here as green, the red is the developmental stage and blue is the late stage. Ignore all the details, but the message here is at the early stage, find microbiome that are involved in um, nutritional um, biosynthesis of um, nutrients and energy. So you will see a lot of beneficial microbes. And as time passes, that the beneficial microbes become, the, the, their diversity is reduced, and then you end up seeing more of the uh, pathobio organisms that are more pathogenic or opportunistic pathogens. So we describe these by <clears throat> in, into three stages, as I mentioned, early stage, developmental stage, and late stage. In early stage, you have a beneficial fungi and bacteria more and less of pathogenic. And as time passes, at the beginning, you see more bacterial diversity and less of fungal diversity. But at late stage, you see more of fungal diversity and less of bacterial diversity. And again, beneficial fungi and bacteria goes down, pathogenic bacteria goes high. So you see, understanding the life cycle is really important because this will help us to design um, uh, probiotics that are that could be more beneficial because if you target some of those beneficial um, microflora to be used as a probiotic, um, I think we'll be in a better shape than any probiotic to be used. Uh, this is a picture that many of you are very familiar. Uh, you often find white strings um, floating on the um, surface of water. Uh, so we were interested to see what is causing or contributing to the um, white feces syndrome. And at the end of last year, we published a paper in PLOS One where we showed that for white, to reproduce white feces syndrome, you need EHP and at least Vibrio parahemolyticus. And there might be other bacteria that could also cause this disease. But in our experiment, what, here is what we did. Uh, let me see if I can turn off. Uh, Okay, so um, we collected the white gut from an animal displaying uh, white feces syndrome, plated them on the media and characterized them. Turn out to be these are Vibrio um, and uh, sequenced the 16S ribosomal um, RNA and also the toxar genes 
basically characterized and found that, okay, this is a Vibrio parahemolyticus. It does not cause, and, and, and it does not carry the binary toxin gene that the apin causing Vibrio are known to carry. So we knew that it is a Vibrio parahemolyticus, but it is not a, um, it is not a apin causing Vibrio. And here is what we did. We ran two trials, two independent trials. So we had four treatments. We had the SPF animal. We had SPF infected with Vibrio parahemolyticus. We had EHP, SPF infected with EHP, and then EHP infected animal challenged with Vibrio parahemolyticus. And what we found that only animals that are infected with EHP and then subsequently infected with Vibrio parahemolyticus produces white feces syndrome. And you can see the white string, uh, fecal strings uh, from an um, challenged animal. And as, as we all know that in SPF animals, the gut or the fecal string is a um, little dark brown color as opposed to the white uh, st uh, fecal strings that tend to float on the surface. It's mainly because the, the sloughed of cells covers the digester. And as it comes out, because the sloughed of cells are rich in lipid, they tend to float on water rather than sinking, which is ha what happens when the animal is SPF. And uh, you can see this one. When you challenge GHP infected animals with Vibrio parahemolyticus, you can see the fecal strings um, attached to the animals. And you can see some fecal string floating in the water. We want to make sure that we can reproduce um, white feces disease under laboratory condition. And our data unequivocally demonstrated that when an animal is infected with EHP and then we come and challenge with Vibrio, it can cause disease. What I will not be able to tell you from this that are there other bacteria that might also cause uh, white feces in combination with EHP? Uh, possibly yes, but um, we, we don't have that data yet. So that's one. And the second very relevant question is, which is the primary driver? Is EHP is the primary driver or it is the bacteria that's the primary driver? So we, we do not know that also. So when we did the uh, HNE histology, you can see that uh, this is the top panel is the healthy animals. And you can see different types of four different types of cells in the uh, hepatopancreas, hepatopancreatic tubule. You can see uh, plasmodium with this big arrow and, and the spores, uh, the EHP spores with this um, triangular um, black triangles. And Notice one interesting thing. When the animals are infected with EHP alone, we do not see this kind of granulomas. What we see is just the plasmodium and the spore. When they're infected with bacteria, you can see masses of bacteria clogging the lumen. And also, you will see some plasmodium. There, there are some hemocytic infiltration and some level of melanization. So, this is interesting because, as I said, we do not know whether EHP suppresses immune response or it evades immune response. That molecular mechanism, which path it takes, is not clearly known. But when the, an EHP infected animal is infected with bacteria, you, might, you, may, you may see a granuloma. Basically, what happens when the epithelial cells sloughed off from the um, hepatopancreatic tubule exposing the basal membrane, that basal membrane becomes a port of entry for opportunistic bacteria. And that's, that's when you will see um, infiltration of hemocytes, melanization, and formation of granuloma. We could detect it by in situ hybridization. Again, that those uh, plasmodium that we thought or presumed based on EH, um, HNE is indeed EHP origin. And one interesting thing we noticed is when, 
when the animal is infected with EHP alone, as opposed to EHP and Vibrio, the EHP copy number also goes high. So there is some level of synergy, it appears. There is some level of synergistic relation between the two, two pathogens. So to summarize this part of my talk, EHP is a threat to the expansion and profitability of shrimp aquaculture worldwide. We all know this today. And it causes dysbiosis in the hepatopancreas microbiota. And each infection cycle follows a cyclic pattern when, where you can see the early stage, developmental stage, and late stage. At the late stage, the, the pathogen load is low, and again, it, it may come back. So basically, when the energy reserves is depleted, you will see the pathogen also retract. It's a unique way how a pathogen evolved with the host and, and it, and it's becoming, and, and this is the reason that it's becoming a chronic pathogen, or just helping the pathogen to become more uh, causing chronic infection. Because if it keeps on depleting the nutrient, the animal will be dead. And if you are an obligate parasite, you don't want to kill the host. So uh, as the energy reserve depletes, it withdraws. And then, uh, then the host tries to come back and then the pathogen again starts, you know, uh, propagating. So that leads to a cyclic pattern of infection. And today we have a simple and robust method of producing large quantity of EHP inoculum um, that could be used to screen um, genetic lines and also could be used to develop um, uh, therapeutics against uh, hepatopancreatic uh, microsporidiosis. I'm going to move on to a uh, very exciting uh, piece of work that we are doing in our lab in terms of developing um, antiviral therapies. And uh, um, let me share with you this set of data. Um, so we all know that there are too many viruses. Um, and the, the number of viruses that are being discovered is increasing. Today, there are over 30 viruses that are known to infect um, known to infect penate shrimp. And we also know that there are many uh, methods and uh, many uh, um, treatments, particularly on uh, RNAi-based uh, treatments developed. However, the challenge is the delivery. There is no simple, robust method to deliver the therapeutics to the animals. So what we did, um, this is a collaborative work that I did with uh, Mahidol University and um, uh, also Tokyo University, Japan. Basically, I had an idea of bypassing the need for um, immortal cell line to produce, to engineer um, RNA virus in shrimp. So we took an um, expression vector, the baculovirus expression vector. It's a dual vector. That means it can express two different recombinant uh, proteins simultaneously. And in one, we, we cloned RNA1. So we cloned RNA1 under the control of polyhedrine promoter and RNA2 under uh, P, uh, Paul 10, another promoter. And um, you make a recombinant baculovirus carrying mRNV genome. And when you take that baculovirus and infect SF9 cells, you can produce baculovirus as well as the mRNV. And when you did this with XSV, the extra small virus that is often associated with mRNV, you can also produce. So again, you can produce mRNV, you can produce XSV, you can also produce, of course, the baculovirus. And these viruses produced in insect cell using a baculovirus expression vector and thereby bypassing the need for an immortal cell line in shrimp can help you to generate infectious virus. And you can see that when this uh, insect cell derived virus was used to challenge venomy, uh, um, a freshwater um, prawn, uh, macrobrachium, we can see different levels of mortality. So bottom line is 
we have been successful in engineering and Shimparne virus using a baculovirus expression system and insect cells. So this was published a couple of years ago. I had, I started thinking, well, if we could generate an, or engineer an infectious virus, why can't we make, or we, why can't we make this virus replication deficient and use that as a delivery vehicle to deliver payloads? And, and uh, one advantage with respect to mRNV is it produces only one capsid protein and, and the uh, tertiary structure, it has a T3, means it needs three polypeptides uh, to form one uh, capsomere, and it has 60 of them to form the particle, okay? And it's an RNA virus, so it, it replicates in the cytoplasm. So here is what we did. We replaced the RDRP domain in the RNA one with GFP, the green fluorescent protein. And we ran this drill, basically make a recombinant baculovirus, and then infect SF9 cells. And that SF9 cells were infected with, again, with a baculovirus that carries GFP gene, which has been replaced. We replace that, uh, replace the RDRP. So what do you expect? So if you do that, theoretically, what we expect is an SF9 cell should be glowing GFP right? Because it has GFP molecules. And I apologize this. Let me see if I can, I don't know why. I'm going to stop this for a moment, okay? Allow me, please. And then see that might help me to overcome this. Okay, that's better. Can you see? Uh, Dr. Rota, can you see the slide? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so here is what we did one more time. So these are baculovirus that carries mRNG genome, but the, in the RNA, one of mRNG, the RDRP domain was replaced with the GFP, and look what happens. They started, so theoretically, they should be producing a GFP, right? So we can separate them. We can make mRNV carrying GFP gene, we can make baculovirus, we can do cell um, sectioning. And then if we feed shrimp with these recombinant virus, those shrimp should be glowing, or at least the, some of the cells that take up that virus should be glowing. And we also did some injection. So let's look what we found. So, when you first infected the SF9 cells with this recombinant virus, the cells were glowing and they were glowing heavily. So that showed, and what do I mean by heavily? You can see almost 91 to all close to 100% cells are infected. And that's not surprising at all because baculovirus is well, well known to infect uh, uh, insect cells. So you can see the level of expression. But what is interesting is, you can see the level of expression. So that means the payload is heavily expressed. And in this case, the payload is a GFP, okay? And so if that's the case, then if we do um, TEM, uh, transmission electron microscopy of cells, SF9 cells, we should be able to see two types of viruses, right? Now, uh, one of the things I want to highlight, this TEM tells you. So when you look, did the TEM take a look at it? You can see the baculovirus, which are more rod-shaped or elongated particles, and then MRNV, which are more like icosahedral particles within a vesicle. So that clearly gave us an idea that it is not only the GFP that's being expressed, but the virus is also matured and assembled virus is being produced. So if that's the case, then we should be able to purify it, right? So we took the SF9 cells and purified the virus. And when we purified, 
we can see the mrnv as well as the baculovirus that gave us enough um, data and confidence to say that we can make a recombinant baculovirus carrying a gfp gene um, which has been inserted into the rna viral genome and now the insect cell is producing a shrimp virus as well as the baculovirus then we fed them. So we had some um, animals, I mean shrimp, and we, we um, either fed them uh, just the regular diet or we mixed that homogenate from the SF9 cells and fed it to them or we injected the homogenate, the cell supernet and carrying both baculovirus and mRNV. And, and then after a few days, we collected leopard and hepatopancreas, and we could detect the capsid protein gene, which of mRNV. That means the virus is taken up by the hepatopancreas, it is circulating in the pleopod. So bear in mind, mRNV is a systemic virus. So as soon as an animal eats um, a diet containing the um, recombinant virus, that virus is spreading throughout the uh, throughout the system of the animals or different tissues. This is very important because if you want to replace the GFP with a therapeutic RNA molecule, you have it. It should be able to spread all over. We did some uh, electron micro TEM of these uh, hemocytes. So after feeding. Uh, this uh, mRNV containing mRNV GFP containing diet, we draw we draw the hemolymph and uh, put them onto a plate and cultured for I think 48 hours uh, or 72 hours, and then took those hemocytes and did some EM. And again, you can see so many particles. This is absolutely exciting. So that means when an animal uh, when an animal consumed diet that was coated with uh, mRNV GFP construct, the virus was taken up by the hemocytes and it spread to different tissues and organs. And you can see here, and those hemocytes were glowing. This is, these are the hemocytes drawn from injection, which is not surprising, but look at when the animals were fed a GP containing construct and the hemocytes is glowing. And one last but very important uh, finding in this uh, graph. So we collected animals at different time points post injection and calculated the copy number in different tissues. And what you find that the vinyl copy number is declining when you fed them. And these are the injection group that remains stable. And it's pretty high because you injected them. But if you look at the uh, different tissues of animals, hemocytes and hepatopancreas, leopard and, and hemocytes, you can see there's a declining number. What it tells, it is a replication deficient virus. So the virus is not replicating. It's a genetically engineered mRNV carrying GFP. It cannot replicate because it doesn't have the functional RDRP. So it is ex this is exactly what you should see that the, the uh, viral number is declining. So I think it is fair to say that successful engineering of mRNV or frankly speaking, any RNA viral vector will pave the way to deliver antiviral therapeutic molecules via oral route. There are a lot of papers on RNAi and injection. And as we all know that that's not a solution. We need to come up with an alternative. And availability of oral therapeutics would really be a paradigm shift in terms of making shrimp aquaculture sustainable because down the road, 
I, I tend to believe that we will be able to mitigate this continuous loss or unpredictable losses because of the disease outbreak. I would conclude making this few comments that again, we are very, all of you are aware of, but nevertheless, I think it is fair to say that diseases remain, will continue to remain as a major threat to shrimp farming. And diseases are evolving. As you heard the um, honorable director of SIVA just mentioned how EHP is now becoming more important than white spot. So diseases are evolving and new diseases will continue to emerge. So long we keep a close eye and, and monitor uh, regularly, we should be able to manage them. And one of the points I want to highlight that much of the world today is focused on the molecular uh, diagnosis. But molecular diagnosis gives you information on a targeted pathogen that you, whatever the pathogen you target. Histopathology, on the other hand, can give you an overall health assessment. And histopathology is complementary in nature to molecular diagnostic. It is not mutually exclusive. And, and this is something that uh, I think we need to emphasize more. And finally, I think it is fair to say that prevention alone is not enough to make shrimp aquaculture sustainable. We need to develop therapies and we need to develop um, methods or tools to deliver those therapeutics in a very cost-effective manner. Until that happens, I don't think shrimp farming can be sustainable. And I'm very hopeful that this next five years we'll see some, some major development in this field. Finally, last but most important, the funding. Our funding. Um, some of our works are funded by USD and IFA through OIE. And most importantly, I'm thankful to the shrimp industry. And without their support, uh, um, we won't be here. And, and also the financial support uh, provided to competitive grants through uh, CALS, College of Agriculture and Life Sciences in the University of Arizona. But without human resources, nothing will happen. So I'm thankful to my colleagues who work tirelessly to serve uh, shrimp aquaculture worldwide. Thank you all. And with that, um, I see there are Thank you, Dr. Dhar, very much. So, yeah, some questions are there in the chat box. So, one yeah, by one, I'll just read it out. Yes, please. So, one is from Dr. Saul Hamid from India. So, what is the size of the prawn used in pathogenicity experiment with MRNB? Because adult prawns have been found to be resistant to MRNB. Um, I can't recall the size. These are not adult. These are juveniles. Um, I need to look into that uh, um, virology paper, but I know for sure these are juveniles. Okay. But exact size, I, I don't remember. Please, second question from Dr. Ananda Raja. So please throw some lights on correlation between high salinity and host susceptibility to EHP. Um, it's an interesting, very relevant question. I'll tell you, what we were thinking at the beginning when uh, we did some survey in India, um, uh, EHP survey in different regions in Gujarat and Andhra Pradesh and, and so forth, we were thinking that EHP may not be prevalent in areas with lower salinity. That was our hypothesis. We did not know what we'll find, of course. Because as, as you can imagine that if the prevalence is reduced at lower salinity, that could be very beneficial in terms of managing, simply changing water and, and in areas with lower salinity, we may see less prevalent. It didn't happen. Um, does high salinity make the animal more stressful, stressed and um, leads to higher uh, EHP inoculum, uh, EHP load? I do not. I, I do not have data to say or, or show you. Uh, so I, I won't be able to tell you exactly what is happening. But uh, what is interesting to me that again, that as much as salinity is an important factor 
but it may not be the critical factor in terms of pathogenicity. If salinity, uh, salt concentrate, different types of you know, monovalent and divalent cations would have been the critical factors in deciding or making the pathogen more virulent or less virulent, it's, it is important, but it may not be the determining factor in terms of its virulence. So that's how I can kind of um, predict based on the data. So one more question from him. What could be the reason for high mortality at late stage of EHE infection with low HP grade and low CT value? Um, can you repeat the question? What would be the... Oh, it's what? asking, so what, like at the less, late stage, so we are getting high mortality when the, in the infection has low grade of HP and low CT value, but mortality is high. So how yeah. is that possible? Yeah, that's, that's an excellent question. And I think um, we can uh, answer this question looking into the cyclic pattern of each infection, because what is happening at the late stage, the energy reserve is low. So when the energy reserve is low, you don't see as much of EHP. So the EHP also will be lower, but the animal will be dead because it's so weak actually. So it's immunocompromised, but on the other hand, it doesn't have enough energy to sustain growth. So you will see they are going to die um, or, or moribund, but also you will see no, less EHP even. So I think the cyclic pattern of uh, EHP um, cycle, life cycle explains um, uh, the, or, or could be the answer to your question. So one more question from Dr. Bala. So like, uh, can we use bacteriophage to remove Vibrio parhematicus under any other Vibrios? Please explain in detail. This is... <laughs> This is, <laughs> thank you so much for <laughs> asking this question. You know, um, bacteriophage historically has been successfully used, particularly, and I'm thinking the Eastern Bloc um, in, in East, Eastern Europe. Bottom line with respect to shrimp, there are papers and, and uh, people have shown that um, bacteriophages can be used. The challenge in terms of developing a, a, a therapeutics based on bacteriophages, specificity issue, because the, the, um, the bac bacteriophages, as you know, are very specific to bacteria. It has to be the binding of the phage the, to, to initiate the infection event is a very specific phenomenon. And it changes there's a mutation both at the host and the pathogen level. So really that, that's the reason that people, whenever they have been successful in terms of using bacteriophage, they use a cocktail of phages. Use a cocktail of phages and constantly monitoring for the emergence of new bacteria would ultimately lead to development of phage-based therapy. I think it is doable. It just needs very targeted way um, to develop Therapeutics. So one more last question. So somebody is telling me, you said about old diseases are less critical when compared with new diseases. Can you explain one second? Um, sure. If, and, and there are many such examples. I think the best example in shrimp industry is the um, Toro syndrome virus. If you look what happened in TSV, uh, in early 90s, when the disease Toro syndrome first appeared in Ecuador and spread to much of Americas and later to Asia, early 90s was really, um, it caused enormous losses. And soon there was an effort to develop resistant lines. And today, most of the lines that are being farmed, these economy lines farmed at a commercial scale, are um, resistant or tolerant to um, TSV. So here is an unique case that you had the pathogen that at one time was so virulent and uh, caused so much of mortalities. Today, it is not. The last report I saw on TSP was 2019 uh, from the Philippines. And there has not been other reports. Now, lack of report doesn't mean that the virus is not there, as you all know. But uh, certainly, 
it is probably not causing, in all probability, not causing as much uh, uh, economic losses. So that's one. IHHN is another one. And IHHN is still is an interesting case, as many of you are probably aware of it. There has been some effort to delist IHHN V, or um, people are thinking that it is needs to be delisted. But if you look how this pathogen is also changing, IHHN V also caused you know, enormous losses and mortalities. If you look into the very first paper that Don Leitner and, and uh, um, Rita Redman published in Journal of Invertebrate Pathology in 1982, the IHHNB paper. It show, in the graph, in the first figure, it shows like 70, 80, 70, between 70 and 80 percent mortality upon IHHN infection. Today, it does not cause, although the prevalence could be very high. So you can see how the pathogen is evolving, host is evolving. So those are the kind of very nice examples of change in dynamics. One is from Dr. Indrani Karuna Sagar. So, so thank you for an illuminating talk on the role of Vibrio Parahemilticus in my opinion. It could be any pathogenic Vibrio depending on the environment from where it is isolated in association with EHP. Um, I think, um, and thank you so much Dr. Karuna Sagar for being here. Yes, um, I, I think what is happening is when EHP infection goes high, the cells start sloughing off. And every cell, and this is the, um, uh, in, the in the hepatopancreatic tubule, as the cell sloughed off, it exposes the basal membrane. And there, um, it would lead to, it could be any number of Vibrio, not necessarily Vibrio parahemolyticus. And in fact, it would be interesting to see that is it only Vibrio parahemolyticus or, or other Vibrio that can also cause uh, white feces disease? It's possible. So one more question from Dr. Ramaraj. So he's asking Dr. Dhar, during the survey on WFS, we have seen high EHP load in low saline ponds that is less than five PPT, but the shrimp were showing fairly good growth and less WFS. Does it question the theory that EHP is responsible for WFS and slow growth? That's a, that's a very good question. I'm always hesitant to jump onto conclusion unless we have more data. I think it's <laughs> many of us are. Um, by the way, this work was done um, with uh, the survey that we did on EHP and other diseases, and uh, uh, Dr. Ramlaj was involved, and Vaishaki Foundation uh, uh, provided some resources to do that. Um, it is tempting to theorize what you did, what you wrote, but I would um, be cautious before making any conclusion until we do some more and a little more thorough study. So until then, um, I would reserve my uh, opinion. Okay, any other question? One more question. Could you please highlight about the healthy microbiome or probiotic therapy for EHP infection? Um, yes, uh, I will be happy to send you the <laughs> manuscript. Uh, it's just about to be accepted in scientific report. If you don't mind, send me an email, I promise you, I will send you today by tonight. Um, there's a whole host of bacterial species. Take a look at it. I, I don't remember all the names, but there are a number of bacterial species that are present in the healthy microbiome and their population declines as the infection progresses. There is um, Dr. Manoj asking, can I? Yeah, ask a question. <laughs> Yes, uh, Dr. Banasurma, you can. Doc, Dr. Dar, thank you so much for a nice presentation. And you know, I'm a farmer. And uh, I've been uh, doing shrimp farming for almost like three decades now, Dr. Dar. And uh, I have seen everything, the monodon, uh, the rise and fall of monodon, Manami, and again now problems in Manami. But sir, with my practice, uh, one thing I have seen that when you do uh, uh, shrimp farming in a positive current capacity, uh, I mean to say that those farmers who are inclined towards intensification and more production are actually inviting problems, especially the diseases. So 
what is your message that uh, uh, because I have been practicing shrimp farming and uh, touch wood never lost a single penny in shrimp farming, whether monodon or banami. But my practice is 10 to 12, 10 to 15 pieces. And I have seen uh, uh, disease jumping over my pond right and left, but and hardly affecting my pond. If it also affects, but the mortality pattern and the loss is very minimal. And uh, that's what, 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 what you think that really the farmer should believe in a positive carrying capacity uh, farming or they should be more inclined towards uh, a very controlled uh, system or high intensification modules. But sometimes it also confuses me if technology and then intensification is the main game changer, then countries like Thailand, China, uh, why they are not doing well. And on the other hand, uh, countries like Ecuador is now ruling the whole world in production. So what is your take uh, on that, uh, Dr. Dhar? Um, thank you so much. I think um, um, I will not hesitate to uh, publicly admit that your knowledge and experience is far greater than mine. You have answered everything. You asked good question, you answered it. Basically, as you said, that um, so long, if you do, let me put it this way. If we go for intensification, you have to really prevent introduction of pathogen. And that is not going to be an easy task by any means, particularly in outdoor ponds set up. I have been, I have been, I'm, I'm in West Bengal now, and I was visiting some farm um, last to last weeks. And the farm where they have less uh, density, they have less white feces issues compared to the ones where they have a much higher density and much higher problem, magnitude of problem. It's a balance. So, and, and the balance, it's not only simple balance, that where you, you want to be. Um, do you want to produce large quantity very within a short time in a small space and take the full risk? Go for it. If not, <laughs> I will go with you. Thank you, sir. Because, because see, one wrong, uh, I, I'll tell you one example because the whole world is listening to you and me. Because one small mistake, what Asia has done is uh, uh, sludge removal or shrimp toilet. You know, that, that has devastated the creeks in the, any shrimp farming nation. One wrong concept on wrong adoption. I'm not saying sludge removing technique is not good, but the adaptation what farmer has done, water. So whatever you do, the biosecurity or prevention and EHP, see in India, now, most of the farms in Andhra Pradesh or everywhere, it has been rattled with uh, EHP. It is 90% of the creeks and the farms are infected with EHP. And I believe uh, this has happened to one wrong adaptation of sludge removing technique just to produce more. And I think, I think it is very dangerous that farmers should uh, really practically and um, they accept uh, they should accept the very um, uh, any technology by looking into the um, uh, 10 year or 20 year effect of that so i strongly believe when, when rana is saying now the ehp has been affected and i think i think shrimp toilet removal and the sludge removal has really really devastated shrimp farming in asia that is all uh, my strong belief maybe maybe most of the people will not believe because because the industry is very pro and and everybody wants to produce more. But because I've been visiting Ecuador from last seven years, and I really, really feel so proud of that, you know, it's sustainable module. The percentage of farming has been very successful, sir. What actually alarming me, Dr. Dhar, India, though producing close to 1 million tons of shrimp, but the success at farm level has reduced gone to only 50%. So there is no margin left to compete to, to the world. Whereas Ecuador, they are producing at the 85, 90% success rate at the farmer. Even with very thin margin, 10 cent, 20 cent, they're still making money. So that is very alarming for Indian shrimp farmers that how now, whether we should take one step ahead, go towards the intensification or take two step back and go for the sustainable models of shrimp farming, sir. Thank you so much for giving me a chance to interact with you. Thank you, sir. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. Absolutely. Um, is the Dr. Kronashagar wants to ask any question or comments, please. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I was just uh, uh, going to comment on uh, 
the issue with regard to the first paper by Don Leitner and uh, Redmond that was published regarding mortalities due to IHSNV. They had shown it in stylo, uh, Pinae's stylirostris, okay? But um, over the years, what has happened is when these viruses have got transmitted to other species like monodon, it has not resulted in mortality, but uh, in growth stunting. They just fail to grow completely, you know. They remain a larger size or maybe maximum three to four centimeters through the entire period of culture, and therefore the uh, the the uh, the problem with IHHNV is not going to be any less important. Stunting of growth, not allowing even maybe a break-even situation for the farmer, rather more expense due to uh, you know incurring it on feed is going to still remain a threat for uh, the shrimp farming industry. That is uh, just a comment on uh, the issue of IHHNV in uh, shrimps. The second thing that I wanted to tell you was uh, bacteriophages on which someone asked now has now been replaced by products of bacteriophages, okay? And uh, we also have applied for patent for some of the products from phages. And therefore, that will probably address the issue of uh, using a consortium. Uh, I mean, I mean, enzybiotics, when I said products from phages. And these are uh, showing great promise in also acting across uh, species. Say for Vibrio, we could try to, to do a large number of uh, Vibrio species as also with other medically important organisms, which is our primary studies now that are going on to address chronic conditions like diabetic foot and also. In the case of shrimp, where we first began uh, using whole phages and consortium has now been gradually uh, replaced by use of uh, phage products. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. And thank you, Dr. Urta, for giving thank the you, opportunity. Thank you. No, I think if I may make one last comment, chronic, and as, as I highlighted earlier also, anytime you have a chronic disease, whether say IHHNV causing reduction in growth or EHP causing reduction, but in a different ways, chronic disease are much harder to control. Acute disease in many ways is relatively easy to control. So you were correct. And Dr. Kornasha, yes. IHHNV is not less. In fact, we just had a paper um, in uh, PLOS one accepted day before yesterday or the, like 72 hours ago, where we showed that in monodon and even in style, uh, in monodon, you can have very high copy number, but no visible lesions. And you can see some growth uh, effect, that's about it. So yeah, a chronic disease is definitely going to be a much more problem. And that's why I think EHP is going to be a problem. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. Dar. So for the very informative talk and uh, many people, they enjoyed it, I'm sure. And uh, uh, within our short notice, you invited our, uh, you accepted our invitation and gave the talk and uh, already you were on vacation, but still thinking about the participants and their uh, benefits. So you accepted our invitation. So thank you very much. And uh, about the participants, so unfortunately we had some only 100 number capacity in the Zoom and it was running full throughout your talk. So many of them could not participate. My apology for that, that. And I thank all the participants for your active participation and many of you asked questions and I'm sure you got clarified from Dr. Dhar. I also thank our director for organizing this useful talk for the stakeholders and the researchers. And I also thank all the scientists of Shiva for their active participation. So thank you all very much. Thank you.